But what I have found, Radhika, is that when I have managed to find that selflessness, that sense of it's really not about me, but I'm really here as a servant to give, then I found two things happen. The first thing is that our ability to actually really serve others um, just expands exponentially. Mm. I think it was Lincoln who said, it's amazing what you can achieve when you don't care who gets the credit. Right. So like when we're totally above that sense of, um, you know, what am I going to get out of this or, you know, and we're just really present to be with that person or that group and, and so amazing things transpire. And the other thing I would say, Radhika, is that it, it's, it's an old saying and, um, and we've heard it many, many times, but it, it, it's, just, it's just the truest thing in the world, which is that when we try to help other people solve their problems, it's like our life just seems to get ironed out in the process. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to For Soul's Sake. My name is Radhika Das, and I'm here to invite you all to conversations about well-being, about Ayurveda, about yoga, about all things mind, body, and soul. And alongside a host of amazing guests, um, I'm really excited to listen, learn, and grow with each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being here. Today, we have another guest who I deeply admire, someone who I'm actually super excited to speak to because uh, they come from the same lineage as I do. They come from a lineage of bhakti yoga, and um, it's the first monk we've ever had on the podcast. So I'm, I'm super stoked that this is happening. Um, His Holiness Swayam Bhagavan Keshav Maharaj, otherwise known as Keshav Maharaj. I want to get into why we call him Maharaj anyway. But before we get into that, I want to tell you guys a little bit about him. Uh, Maharaj is a spiritual author, a community mentor, a dynamic teacher, and worldwide traveler. 2002, after graduating from UCL with a BSc in information management, he adopted full-time monastic life to expand his knowledge, deepen his spirituality, and share these timeless principles with the wider society. For over 20 years, Keshav Swami was a resident monk at ISKCON UK's headquarters Bhaktivedanta Manor. There he pioneered the school of bhakti, led the monastic training program and drove forward national spiritual outreach projects. He's designed numerous courses on Vedic theology, lifestyle management and spiritual self-development and also authored 10 books which bring the ancient bhakti wisdom into the modern context. In 2022, just last year, Keshav Swami accepted vows of a lifetime in renunciation. Nowadays, he's a globetrotter, teaching in universities, corporate firms, government organizations, and spiritual communities, bringing wisdom to the places which need it most. He continues to diligently study the Sanskrit texts, considering how to proliferate spiritual wisdom in a world that is suffocating from materialism. Keshav Maharaj, thank you so much for being here. It's a great honor, a great privilege. And uh, yeah, deeply grateful that you're spending your time with us today. Radhika, it's an honor. It's always great to spend time with you. And as you know, in our tradition, Sangha and spiritual association coming together with serious and sincere and uh, deep practitioners of bhakti is mm. such a, such a um, soul nourishing experience. So I'm, I'm really excited. Yeah. It should be a good combo. I'm actually, this is probably the first combo I'm most excited about. I can, I can hands down say this is like, yeah, a groundbreaking moment. We're having a Swami on the podcast. Um, but I want to ask, in terms of address, I mentioned that your name is Keshav Maharaj. It's, of course, short for a long name. Why are Swamis known as Swamis or Maharajas or Rishis? Or what's, the, what's the correct cultural way in which we should address you just... That's always a question I get. So Yeah, yeah. Before I say the definitions of all of these titles, I should say that I'm an aspirant. I don't <laughs> pretend to be uh, come in front of you as a perfected soul or a realized uh, yogi, but definitely someone who's picked up amazing jewels on the path and just try to share them in whatever humble way I can. Mm. Swami is a title which refers to one who has conquered the, the senses Mm -hmm. um, and that's such a big thing in the world today because, you know, we're just attacked, constantly bombarded with so much agitation, provocation, distraction. And one who learns and, and, and masters their senses amidst that 
um, deluge of uh, attack um, is definitely accomplished and it can only be done through spiritual practice. So yeah, Swami means one who's conquered the senses. Maharaj is an interesting term because for those of you who know anything about ancient India, Maharaj is the, 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 the term that refers to a king or right. a monarch. Right. And, and um, a renunciate seems almost diametrically opposed to a monarch. I mean, monarchs are living in palaces, renunciates are living in caves, but they're also known as Maharajas because they, they may not be kings of uh, huge uh, territories of land, but they've managed to um, gain control over their minds mm. and therefore not just the senses, but to, to, to conquer the mind. So... Um, yeah, Swami, Maharaj, Rishi means a great thinker mm -hmm. um, and, and one who's able to see life um, beyond just the superficial and see what's behind it, the hidden story. Um, so, yeah, it's these, these are titles we're aspiring towards. Wow. I don't know what to call, call you now. <laughs> we go Swami, Rishi, Maharaj. <laughs> Maharaj, I think, is appropriate. Yeah. So, uh, Maharaj, we get a lot of guests on the podcast that are... Uh, of the physical realm, yoga teachers, uh, even sound healers that deal with the subtle body, perhaps the mind, the intelligence, the ego. Um, we've never had someone that is a person who is propagating the soul. Mm -hmm. What is the soul? How can we understand uh, that essence which lies beyond the body? Is it accessible? Is it possible in today's age? Or is it something that only rishis, swamis and maharajas can access? Yeah, such a nice question. In Sanskrit, we have a beautiful word, Atma. Mm -hmm. And Sanskrit is such an incredible language because one word can refer to multiple things depending on context. So sometimes Atma refers to the body, the physical body. Sometimes Atma refers to the mind. But most often, Atma refers to the soul, um, the spirit, the spark of consciousness, there's a sense in which we have different aspects to our self. Sometimes I say there's, there's the third self, which is the physical. There's the second self, which is the mental and emotional. And then there's the first self, which is the soul, the atma in terms of the spirit, the consciousness. And the first self is the self which is animating, driving, and um, giving life to all other aspects of the self. So in ancient Eastern theology, it's not that the body or the mind are unimportant. They are aspects of the self. But the real self, the, the deepest self, the ultimate self which gives life is, is the spirit self, mm. the first self. And... So much of what we do in our spiritual um, journey and our spiritual practice is really to connect with that deepest self. And um, one, one analogy that our teacher, Srila Prabhupada, who was really a bhakti ambassador for the whole world, he gave the analogy of a bird in a cage. Right. And he said that naturally because we're, the bird's living in the cage, the cage has to be maintained, cleaned, and um, taken care of but if you just keep polishing the cage but you don't feed the bird <laughs> then uh, we're on a bit of a loser there and it's so simple that we j may just miss that in civilization you walk down the street and look at all the shops and they're catering to the body and the mind but you'll very rarely find a shop that helps you to connect with the soul and mm. and, and that's why spirituality and um, spiritual texts and teachers and um, paths are so important. Mm -hmm. Wow. Is it possible, though, to access the soul in today's day and age? Like you just mentioned, we live in an age which is surrounded with things that scintillate the mind and the body, but not very many places that give you access to the soul. And is, that, is it far-fetched to even try to even attempt to connect with that spiritual self? Is it... Yeah. Is it possible, is, is the question? The mantra we often give people is disconnect to connect. Mm. And there's a sense in which, as you said, the world is so mad, the world is moving at just such a breakneck speed that only when we disconnect from that world, 
um, and, and, and begin to create some space in our life, then the connection becomes very much possible. Then the connection becomes uh, achievable and something which doesn't seem so ethereal but can become very tangible. And so as monks and, and, and as you do as a bhakti practitioner, we, we take that sacred space in the morning and we disconnect before the world is moving, before the, you know, the, the chaos starts. Mm. And we take that time to connect. And so I think uh, the first step in connection is building the right lifestyle, the right habits, and the right kind of um, culture around you which, which supports that connection. And then it becomes a possibility. What's what's a conducive lifestyle? That what does that look like? I know you mentioned rising early, um, but yeah, is, I want to hear what 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 do I need to do on my day to day yeah, to, yeah. to disconnect to, to connect? That's a huge uh, that's a huge topic, and the Bhagavad Gita, which is considered like the one of the most uh, ancient and comprehensive spiritual texts spends about 100 of its 700 verses talking about something called the three modes of nature. Mm -hmm. That there are basically three primary influences in the world. In Sanskrit, tamas, which means um, ignorance. Uh, rajas in Sanskrit, which almost means like a, an impulsiveness type of passion. And um, sattva, which means goodness. And this is such an incredible framework because what the Bhagavad Gita explains is that everything around us um, and indeed our lives itself are guided by one and most often a combination of these. So when you understand this framework deeply, then everything from the food you eat to the way you drive your car, to the way you dress your body, to the environment that you surround yourself with to the way you um, lead in your corporate um, life wow. everything can be in one of those modes wow. and as soon as we begin culturing sattva or goodness in all of these things then we begin to build a lifestyle which looks um looks very conducive mm. to to spiritual connection and not just spiritual connection, but when you live in sattva, your physical and mental health improves. When you live in sattva, your relationships will improve. Wow. When you live in sattva, your potential um, to achieve things in this world increases. When you live in sattva, your character and qualities and the best version of yourself um, is crafted. And you just feel an overall sense of happiness and contentment. So mm. sattva or goodness, which is described by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, is basically the blueprint for the best type of lifestyle you can wow. lead. Yeah. Wow, this this stuff should be on billboards everywhere. I don't yeah. know why that you know, <laughs> what's the world missing? Why why have we been so aloof to living in uh, you said is sattva is like a mode of goodness. It's yeah. Pure Yeah. I mean, but we're kind of touching on that somewhat, right, in the world that we live in. Like, Definitely. you know, people are living healthier lifestyles. They're becoming more conscious about their sleep and their eating. Um, this Jay Shetty, who's, who's promoting good relationships. And I feel like we're moving in that direction. Do you think that we'll live in a utopia where everyone is able to live like that? And if not, then is it far-fetched to even try? We can't control the world but we can try to be the change we want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. I really feel as monks, we were taught this from day one, that if you change yourself, maybe you'll be able to have an effect on the people around you. And maybe if you're able to do that with their help, it could go further afield and then further afield. So I feel we just have to walk the talk and be the change we want to see in the world and then and then see how far that will reach. Mm. In the ancient bhakti tradition, one thing we realize is that we're actually just instruments. Right. And how providence and how divinity will move our life and the influence we have is not fully under our control. 
But that's not disempowering because what it basically means is that we just have to do our best, make a make an effort, make an endeavor, and then uh, and then see in what way we're able to uh, make our contribution to the world. Mm -hmm. And so, you, and you're totally right. Like these things are things people are talking about. Like, um, you know, you go into Waterstones and every book on the shelf in the in the smart thinking section is, is you know it's the 5 a.m club you know <laughs> it's the uh, atomic habits yep. you know it's the monk who sold his ferrari and decided to disconnect from the world and and hang out with the sages and see what more there could be to life so yeah these are ian pavlov he says if you want to find a new idea go to an old book <laughs> so there's yeah. a sense in which it's all there, you know. Right. But um, but I do feel that the authors of today are very um, ingenious and 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 very, yeah, expert in unpacking that for the modern audience. And for that, I think you know we can learn even a lot from them. Mm. Yeah. I think it's beautiful how you have made it your life's mission to disseminate this knowledge. And I think there's very few examples of people that are doing that without desire for gain. Um, I wanted to ask you honestly, and, and you know, and once it's confidentially, but the whole world is listening. Um, do you feel that there is really no sense of desire for wanting something in return for all the efforts that you put in? How have you navigated that, that emotion or that, that deep-seated desire in one sense? Yeah. <clears throat> We're here to be honest, so I'll be very, very honest with you. I don't think when I teach, I'm completely above selfishness. I think there's a sense in which uh, we all look for some appreciation. We all look for some validation. Uh, it brings us joy to know that we're able to influence others, obviously in a positive way. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, when there's, uh, you know, you're racking up the numbers and things like that, how many of us are going to say we don't look at that and feel some sense of, you know, self-worth? <laughs> so I wouldn't say I'm, I'm not going to sit in front of you and pretend that I'm a completely selfless um, sharer of wisdom. Yeah. But what I have found, Radhika, is that when I have managed to find that selflessness, that sense of it's really not about me, but I'm really here as a servant to give, then I found two things happen. The first thing is that our ability to actually really serve others um, just expands exponentially. Mm. I think it was Lincoln who said, it's amazing what you can achieve when you don't care who gets the credit. Right. So like when we're totally above that sense of, um, you know, what am I going to get out of this or, you know, and we're just really present to be with that person or that group and, and serve. Amazing things transpire. And the other thing I would say, Radhika, is that it, it's it's an old saying and um, and we've heard it many, many times, but it, it, it's, just, it's just the truest thing in the world, which is that when we try to help other people solve their problems, it's like our life just seems to get ironed out in the process right when we try to help other people become wise we become wise in the process when we mm -hmm. try to authentically and genuinely awaken happiness in others we feel a type of contentment that you don't you just don't experience in anything else mm. and so that level of selflessness is is um is is our aspiration and so to teach with selflessness one of my mentors used to say to me, because he saw I like to share wisdom. And one day he just took me to one side and he said, some people love to teach, but other people love the people they teach to. <laughs> wow. And he said, uh, be the second type. Because you can go out there and it can be about us, you know, and it can get a bit, you know, especially in today's world on social media and feeling like, you know, you become an influencer but it really always has to remain a, a saver or a selfless service. Is it also wrong in any sense to, because we're talking about selflessness and <clears throat> forgive me if I'm speaking out of time, but I find that that's so lofty. 
and it's such a high standard does and it almost puts me to a place where maybe I should stop sharing if if there's even a, a dint of that within my character um interestingly enough a lot of our guests on the podcast have spoken about the healthy nature of accepting when you are doing something that's good um and as with everything there's a nuance and a balance of how you navigate accepting gratitude and accepting that yeah you did do something for the world and at the same time being renounced from yeah no no that wasn't me it was a, it was a higher power that was at work there mm. so that how does one navigate that space yeah we are um we works in progress works in progress we works in progress and we have to realize that you know it's a process selflessness is a process it's uh we it, it comes and it goes and there are days of selflessness and then you know a selfish intent comes back in it creeps back in and it's just it's about just gradually tipping that scale more and more and and moving towards a, a life of giving wow. um to, to to give is to live you know and so i think as you said we have to just be um we have to be aware we have to do a lot of introspection i feel that as i share more and more with the world there's a need for me to become more and more introspective because i feel like uh, i have more and more of a responsibility to be authentic and to to really have the right motivation mm. it's interesting i think when we speak like here we are speaking into these mics and I think when you speak you're not just communicating information but you're communicating something of your heart mm -hmm. something of your own conviction and hopefully something of your own purity and people often pick up on that you know and so I would just say Radhika that we we're, we're on a we're all on a journey and at the end of every day we got to go to bed at night and just spend a few moments thinking before we go to sleep of um you know do i love the people i'm sharing with do i do it with compassion is it is it about them or is it about me and just to continuously recalibrate ourselves in that way and um and yeah it's i think i think those scales can tip yeah yeah i fully agree <laughs> but um yeah i think the work in progress part is the part that i struggle with is the patience of knowing that the process works being patient that this human experience is a, an experience of learning mm. and uh that yeah not to present oneself as the perfect article mm. and uh, i love how in the introduction you immediately spoke about how you're an aspirant of the word swami an mm. aspirant of the word rishi and maharaj and um i think people exactly how you said it people are really perceptive about whether this person is authentically genuinely telling their truth but at the same time honest about where they're really at and um i think that that wave of authentic spirituality is about to hit you just get the taste people are looking for less the polished guru and more the aspiring sage you know mm -hmm. it's it's becoming the age of that and it's becoming more and more clear to me that that's what we should be trying to uh Yeah, it's it's something that I read recently in one of the postgraduate books of Bhakti. It's called the Shrimad Bhagavatam, where it talks about how um, many many topics, but the verse that in particular that I read was around presenting oneself in the knowledge that you are crooked, mm. and admitting to one's crookedness, and admitting to yeah, I'm not the perfect article, and that's okay. It's in yeah, I mean, you mentioned the Shrimad Bhagavatam, and it's interesting because it almost gives this model of society. and it says that society rests on four pillars mm. and the four pillars are cleanliness mm -hmm. austerity mercy and truthfulness and if for for our viewers out there anyone who's aware that in the in the ancient eastern kind of cosmic cycle we go through four periods and then it comes all the way down and in each period there's a degradation so it said that in each of the cosmic ages one of the pillars um gets annihilated right and so by the time we come to the the current epoch you know which is known in sanskrit as kali yuga it said that society is only standing on one pillar and that one pillar is truthfulness, truthfulness. Mm -hmm. 
And that, I, I always found that fascinating because to me, one of the ways I think we can look into that is that we may have lost all our good qualities. We may have lost our mercy, our integrity, our sincerity, our compassion, purity. But in all of that, mm. if we can actually be truthful, if we can be honest, if we can come clean in our weakness mm. and truly seek um, improvement, then everything else can be made up. And therefore, that honesty, that truthfulness, that authentic um, expression of this is who I really am, but I'm, I'm working to improve, I think it, it, it is what the world needs. It's we need more needs. truthfulness. We yeah. need more truthfulness. Yeah, yeah. How does one cultivate that though? How does one begin to be more truthful? It sounds like a silly question, like yeah. just be more truthful. <laughs> yeah. There must be a process, no? How does one develop that? Because it takes, I think there's an element of humility there that you have to understand that, yeah, I'm not perfect. But what is the what is the process of someone that feels that I want 2023, whatever's left of it, I want it to be more perfect, more based in honest, um, yeah, truthfulness, let's call it. A good friend. Wow. Truthfulness and honest exchange and honest uh, opening of one's heart only happens in relationship. Where we have a relationship with someone of trust, of love, where we have a relationship and we feel we won't be judged, a relationship in which you feel like you'll receive the help and support to actually improve and elevate yourself out of where you are, I think in that kind of scenario, truthfulness can grow. And, and that's the world we're living in today, unfortunately, that people don't have those relationships. Yeah. They say we're more connected than ever before, but we're further and further apart. It's crowded loneliness, you know, and people, how much honest uh, exchange, authentic exchange is there? So I feel that, you know, what we're doing here and 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 what what would happen in uh you know civilizations of the past where there was so much FaceTime, you know, and I don't mean like on the <laughs> on the on the phone, I yeah. mean like real FaceTime, um, where we could, you know, deepen these relationships. I think that's what's needed. And and therefore in our even in our spiritual communities, the amazing thing is we find even in spiritual communities that this is a problem you know crowded uh, loneliness crowded loneliness you know and uh i think we've all experienced that and it's funny because when i came to become a monk i was actually looking to go away from all relationships mm. like i was of a certain mindset you know and i thought i'll become a monk <laughs> i'll lock myself away in my room and it will be me and the divine reality. And, you know, I'll shut myself off from this world. Um, I'll become socially dead. That was my aspiration. And then when I came that to the... That scares me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's strange. I mean, it, it must be, I don't know. I came into this world with that kind of um, mindset. But then when I explored the bhakti tradition, every other day in the monastery, I was hearing the importance of developing relationships. And mm. I was like, but I don't want relationships. I want to. And then later on in my kind of hopefully some maturity, I've realized that it's those relationships which take you to your potential and which help you to, um, yeah, reach your destination, you know. An African proverb says, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. But if you want to walk far, walk with many. Mm. So, and not just walk with many, but have genuine connections, at least with a few, so that you can open your heart. So, yeah, relationships, yeah. That sounds so counter to a renounced life. Yeah. You know, when I'm sure when someone's, um, th there's going to be people that are watching this that have never seen a monk in their life, or this is their first exposure to <laughs> monk philosophy and monk life. And um, it just sounds so opposite to what you'd expect. It's like when you hear the word monk, you think solitude, you think no possessions, you think, um, yeah, a life which is, in one sense, rejecting modern normal values. Or, yeah. Or what, the way that, but what you're speaking about here, it, it feels. Maybe I can be a monk. 
Yeah. You know? And uh, is that something that you desire? Do you want all, do you think the world would be a better place if everyone was renounced and everyone was a monk? There's a sense in which there's a monk mindset that I think anyone can adopt. Mm -hmm. Before I come to your point, it's almost as though we've gone full circle because in the beginning you asked me about the body, mind and the soul. And what we're walking away from as spiritualists is relationships which are superficially based on the body and mind. Yeah. But what we're trying to enter into is relationships which are based on the first self, the real self, the spiritual self. In other words, bhakti is all about spiritual relationships and connecting on a deeper level, serving each other with an aspiration to move towards the ultimate spiritual goal that we both have. And so, um, so, and, and so monks live a particular life, you know, um, we sleep on the floor, uh, live communally. Mm. We try to fit everything we have into a locker and not expand it beyond that. We um, try to eat simple and live in sattva. And it's a particular lifestyle. And that particular external lifestyle may not be suited for everyone because mm. we're all individual and you know each to his own and 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 that everyone has to find their way but the underlying mantra of the monk mindset is simple living high thinking mm -hmm. whereas nowadays we say people are simply living hardly thinking <laughs> you know i love that um, but simple living high thinking and i and i think and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because you're out there in the world doing amazing things and very much in, you have a family, a beautiful son. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's something you can apply in your life in your own way. Yeah. You know, and simplicity and high thinking in your life situation may look slightly different to mine's, but, uh, but the principle still can stand. Mm. And so I think if we're able to... You know, there are aspects like this of the the monk mindset that I think can be applied in all spheres of life. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, one of the things that actually we share quite often on this podcast is something that I got from you actually, is that there's the principle and there's the detail. Mm. And so, you know, a lot of people ask often, "Do you really fast, Radhika? Like, is that something that you you know? It's in the Vedic culture to fast every couple of weeks." And I said, "Yeah, I." I I mean, today, believe it or not, those of you that are watching today is a day where I'm fasting. I'm, I'm you know, trying to refrain from eating certain food products in an, in, in an attempt to deepen my connection and to cleanse my mind and consciousness. And um, one thing that I found is quite interesting is people find it absurd to fast from food. But what I often tell them is, okay, fine, if you can't fast from food, if that's something that, you know, the detail is is, is missing there, then the principle still applies that we need to sometimes disconnect exactly how you say mm. to connect. So why not do a day every couple of weeks where you fast from your phone? Mm. Why not do a day every couple of weeks where you fast from toxic language? You know, mm. stay away from profanity once every couple of weeks, you know, <laughs> see if that works for you. And the principle and the detail, okay, maybe I took it too far. Maybe you can correct me. But I think that yeah, this is something that we can all somehow apply. The principle of renunciation and the yeah. detail can differ according to your life circumstance. Yeah, and I think it's a real art to do that. And I think when we're able to do that, then we see how the ancient wisdom is eternally relevant. Right. We right. see how books right. from thousands of years ago, they're timeless in what they have to offer. But I think often what happens in the world is we kind of look at these literatures and because we may not have the appropriate way in which to apply them, we almost feel them to be irrelevant. Um, recently, we've been doing some teaching on the Bhagavad Gita and we were talking about how Arjun, who's the one you know, receiving the wisdom on the battlefield from Krishna, mm -hmm is not just a historical warrior from 5,000 years ago in modern-day North India on a battlefield, which sometimes seems so removed Completely. from us. Mm -hmm. But Arjun, if you look at the essence of his character, his journey, his confusions, his questions, and his 
eventual transformation very much relates to um, the soul, the, the soul on its journey in this world. So right. in one sense, there's a inner Arjun within everyone. There's a battlefield and as well. There's a battlefield and there's, you know, there's questions and there's confusions and, you know, there's a midlife crisis somewhere in there as well, you know, and, and all these things we go through. And so when you begin looking at literature beyond just uh, the immediate kind of what you read on a page and, and learning how to apply it and translate it, mm. then um, then you begin to see like, wow, this is uh, this is amazing. Mm. And, and therefore like, yeah, I picked up the Bhagavad Gita like when I was 15 and like, yeah, almost three decades later, I'm still studying it. And I just think like, wow, it just contains the keys to everything from leadership to lifestyle management from science to spirituality from religion to relationships just everything is um as long as we know how to translate and this apply exactly it exactly what i was going to ask yeah. that at the age of 15 did it make sense to you like did the bhagavad gita no, it just went like, <laughs> boom. <laughs> it was funny because I got a copy and I took it home and I was sitting there and I was just thinking, oh my God, this is it now. I'm going to open this book and all the keys to life, the universe well, and everything. Out like that on this podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. But I opened it and I was just like, after a page I closed, I was just like, whoa. <laughs> um, but the amazing thing was, even though I didn't grasp it, mm -hmm. There was something in that narrative, some some spiritual, yeah, kind of uh, influence that touched me and told me deep within my heart that there's something here. Wow. But I think you need to get some help, you know, to like understand it. And that's when I began going in and meeting the monks and and saying like, yeah, what's this all about and how does it apply? And in that exchange as you said, we would then begin to translate and apply it. And you're like, wow, this is... We live, but here's the caveat. We live in an age where a lot of people are believing that the age of guru is dead. Mm. That, no, I can figure it out on my own. And I think that there is... Um, I think it's mostly in part, mostly because of poor leadership or people being misinformed and misdirected and, you know, oh, no, you're going to get brainwashed, you know, be careful, don't spend too much time with these people, you're going to get brainwashed, you're not going to be able to function in the world. And what's your take on accepting a spiritual teacher, a guru, a guide? Mm -hmm. Is it necessary? Is it really necessary? Yeah, it's, uh, they say in the age we're living in, um, followers question everything and leaders do questionable things. <laughs> totally true. So it's like on both sides, you got like this, and then you get this, you, you end up in an air and, and an atmosphere of extreme skepticism. Mm. Like, I don't need to listen to anyone. I, you know, the reality is that anything we wanted to learn in life, we had to learn from a teacher. Mm-hmm. If someone says, I don't want to accept a guru, if they applied that to every aspect of their life, they wouldn't be able to get anywhere. Now, someone may say, but spirituality is different because it's deep within you. It rests within you. Everything else is external knowledge. So you need a teacher. But spirituality, that's within you. Why yeah, should you I'm need anyone? Guru. Yeah, I'm my own guru. One thing I think is that I think people have the wrong conception of a guru almost like someone on the high seat, the all-knowing oracle who you invest your complete faith in and then who you have no ability to question and have a dialogue with, who then tells you what you should do and then you have to unquestionably follow. Yeah. If you look at Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita as the guru of Arjun, it's pretty amazing because the first thing that Krishna does is he just kind of just listens and he doesn't actually say anything until Arjun asks him a question. So right. that's really nice. And then Krishna is just encouraging Arjun to question him. And Arjun does that. When Krishna offers some advice, then if Arjun doesn't resonate with it, he's able to come back and have a dialogue. Um, 
Krishna gives options. He says, if you don't want to do this, you can do this and you can then do this. We begin starting to see the guru-disciple relationship in a slightly different light. That uh -huh. is not just this heavy, top-down, vertical relationship of authority. But there's actually a lot of love there. There's a lot of friendship. There's a lot of human, you know, closeness. And the cherry on the cake is that right at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna just says this beautiful verse. And maybe with your permission, I'll say it Please. in Sanskrit because it, it just has a, a beautiful impact. Krishna says, Itite guyat guyataramaya. Krishna has just spent all this time giving this amazing wisdom to Arjun. And then he just looks at Arjun and he says, I've given you the knowledge. Just think about it. Reflect on it. Introspect. Challenge it. And then Krishna says, and then do what you want to do. Wow. In other words, there's no force, there's no coercion, there's no expectation, there's no emotional kind of cornering. Um, it's just almost like I'm here to help you and ultimately I respect your individuality. Wow. So now we begin to see the whole guru in a different light yeah. that, you know, it's actually, it's just the most beautiful thing um, to have someone in your life like that who can just coach you to 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 find your um potential your yeah. spiritual potential yeah. and and you know we we both sit here as individuals who've been graced by the uh presence of spiritual teachers in our lives yep. and um i think we can both testify to how empowering encouraging and elevating that has been in our journey so yeah knowing the trajectory that you're on or even just like hypothesizing and, and looking 10, 20 years into the future, you've got quite the following already as it speaks, you know, like there's a lot of people that want you to be considered their guru and their teacher. Does that scare you? Does that, do you have any reservations for taking up that responsibility? Naturally. <laughs> <laughs> We've lived with ourselves our whole life and we know where we were, um, how we begun the journey, the struggles we had along the way. We're very aware of our own weaknesses, where we fall short. Yet we can't also deny that we picked up so many spiritual gifts on the way. We picked up so many spiritual blessings. We um, were invested with so much spiritual care and love and what i see myself as now is a it, it, it is the product of all of that and therefore if uh someone approaches me in that spirit to to ask for help i really just see that i'm trying to share with them what i've received wow Ego and pride is, you know, always there lurking. And we know in the Christian tradition, they say pride cometh before the fall. So every day we do that check, that gratitude check to remind ourselves that um, we were not self-made. We were made on um, the kindness of our predecessors. And so... Being a guru is just, for me, being a representative of my teachers. Mm. To just be a transparent via medium to just pass on what I received. Mm. To not um, let my own ego or pride or ideas get in the way of that, but to try and genuinely pass on all that wisdom and care and love. And so, but it is daunting. And... Um, and therefore, I also make sure I remain connected with my gurus. If my whole life I'm functioning as a guru, then I can get into the illusion that I've made it. Um, but I don't want to be in that illusion because I know there's, there's a lot more to discover and learn. And so every day I connect with my teachers and in that way engender that humility and that... Um, 
reality and honesty that um yeah i'm 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 not that great but i can still help if i yeah. pass on what i've received yeah. one of the uh, most beautiful definitions of humility that i've heard is that it's not that you think less of yourself mm. but that you think about yourself less mm. and place yourself less in the center of attention at the front of the bus at the back of the i don't know the church the church <laughs> <laughs> not many people go to church nowadays but the back of uh, any any space and the center of attention mm. and uh i just loved how given that question i was i was really kind of seeing what angle you're going to take with it but to say that it's not about you but rather that you're placing the teachings as and placing the um the gifts that you've been given at the forefront as opposed to yourself. Yeah. And I think that's quite powerful. Um it's almost like you I mean you're out there, you know, sometimes chanting in in a room of I'm hundreds, be now. yeah. This is too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I yeah. mean it, it it's your life. You do that and you know there's a thousand people or hundreds of people and yeah. and and you're leading that and it's in such an energy in the room. and in that moment um you close your eyes and and remind yourself it's the mantra it's the mantra it's the sound vibration i'm just the i'm just the deliverer mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. it's not always easy <laughs> not always easy it's not always easy At this point I want to see if there's anything I've been asking you a lot of questions I've been directing the combo and I think it's always valuable to hear the perspective of our guests as well and what's alive for them at the moment no strings attached you can speak about anything or maybe bring to the the table something that's really on your mind at the moment Mm Of course we see in the world today um uh, a lot of division a lot of conflict I think uh, as all of us turn on the news we'd we'd really wish the world was a better place and um and that you know we could find some peace in the world today. Mm. One thing I was reflecting on this morning is Einstein he said you can't solve the problems of the world with the same type of thinking that created them. Mm. Yep. And so you know every day I think one of the most important things we need to do in the world is to try to share genuine wisdom with people so much of uh your work is to um you know to 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 get that mantra out there to get people meditating to f help people find that that sanctuary in spiritual sound but what i wanted to also say is i really appreciate you doing this podcast as well because here we begin to also exchange a lot of wisdom and a lot of teachings um which i think um helps it all to go that much deeper um which helps us individually and which also then begins to um craft a better and more beautiful world that we're living in and um yeah we live in these times and we often say we have taller buildings but shorter tempers we have wider freeways but narrower minds we have more conveniences but less time we buy more but we enjoy less we have more wealth but less health we've conquered outer space but not inner space and um this is the paradox of our time and so i think i just wanted to really say that i really appreciate that you've also brought this forth as part of your offering to the world and i just think you know study of ancient wisdom can really help people on an individual level to solve so many problems and 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 can really go a distance to yeah creating a more beautiful worlds so wow. yeah that that i guess that's what i'm trying to do in my own small way yeah. in the world that's my it. that's You're my passion it. um yeah my my little tagline is wisdom that breathes Mm. And so to really share not just wisdom but wisdom that's alive wisdom that's relevant wisdom that can be applied 
and wisdom which addresses the human condition. And every time I read the ancient wisdom books, I just see how relevant it is. And so... Um, I feel like you're reading a different book to me. <laughs> you know, I, have a, I have a thing where like, I know that my time is limited and also my brain capacity is not to the point where I can sit for hours on end reading spiritual literature. Mm. But I do my part. Every day I make a vow. I'm going to read something. Mm. So that way at least I'm not going out into the world without, um, yeah, let's call it m mentally naked. Yeah. And um, yeah, oftentimes I find that is it me or is, is Keshav Maharaj reading a different book to me? Because I don't <laughs> seem to see the same lessons that he's seeing. Yeah, I, I wanted to know just personally, this is a personal question. How does one read properly? Like how are you, what is your method of extracting these truths? I think you're being humble. <laughs> but you know, the process of learning in the material world is almost a linear process. Yeah. So people think that they learn like this, like you start with this much knowledge and then you go like up and up and up and up. The irony with that is you're getting more and more information, but often it's becoming more and more superficial as well. Yeah. Whereas in spiritual circles, I would say the process of learning is like a spiral and it almost comes down like this conical shape yeah and then it comes here it almost feels like you're just reading the same things but it's going deeper and deeper and deeper and it's coming to an es essence which is actually very very simple mm -hmm. so if you can just first try and cement this in your mind that spiritual learning is like a spiral and what does that spiral mean and how through that spiral learning do you go deeper the first thing is you have to read repeatedly. In the world nowadays, people don't read repeatedly. They read one thing, throw it away, and then yep. it's like consuming information. But like I've been reading the Bhagavad Gita for 30 years, and mm. it's like that's repeatedly. So that's the first thing, that the more you read spiritual literature repeatedly, it's almost like an onion. You, you, know, you start peeling off layers. Mm -hmm. The second thing is read broadly. And what I mean by that is there are like, for example, you take a book like the Bhagavad Gita. So it's amazing that many commentators over the ages have added their reflections on the Bhagavad Gita. And so you can almost read one verse of the Gita and then broadly read all of these different insights and then get a deeper understanding. So that's another thing I do. I don't necessarily read different things, but I read broadly within that subject matter. The third thing is I, uh, I read discursively. In other words, with others. Oh. Study with others, mm -hmm. you know, and, and hear their insights. Take a verse. Let's five of us get in a room, take one verse of the Bhagavad Gita, churn. and let's see what we can churn out of that. Yeah. And the, f the fourth and final thing I would say is um, we don't just go deeper by doing it uh, repeatedly, broadly, and discursively, but we get deeper by um, also practically applying that knowledge and, and, and reading something and saying, what does this mean for my life? Mm -hmm. how, does, how is this going to change the way I function tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And when you bring that knowledge into the world, into your life, into your interactions with others and your daily functioning, it's almost like deeper insights appear. Yeah. So I think that that's like a technique everyone can do. So yeah. just, just try it, you know, like spiral learning, you know, and, and, yeah. and you'll find you'll, you'll go deeper. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, that last one really speaks to me because that's something I do definitely try to do which is to um, make it practical. Like today, I can tell you all, today I read from the Bhagavatam about Narada Muni um, disseminating knowledge about divinity, about God, telling, he's being asked, um, please kindly share about mm. God, about Krishna. For me, God is Krishna. So please kindly share. And uh, in the purport, it's described about how one should learn through disciplic succession. And so I thought, how the heck am I going to do that today? Like, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to give him disciplic succession today. But um, I thought, okay, look, 
Keshav Maharaj is in town, he's coming to our podcast, let me really try to hear about the way in which he disseminates knowledge and how he is uh, explaining all things divine. And I guess that's where I want to ask the next question. Um, what's the essence? Like, what, what is it that you said it a few times, that, that conical example of how it spirals towards the mm. essence? What is spiritual perfection? What is spiritual perfection? And um, is it possible? To love and to be loved is what we seek in our heart of hearts. To be able to express our affection and then to receive that affection back. Everything in life is for this purpose. But where, where will we be able to find that connection in which we'll be able to fully give ourselves without reservation and then have that reciprocation in a way that fully nourishes our own being. Therefore, the essence is very, very simple. We started today by talking about how we're spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, we have a connection with the Supreme Spirit. Some call that Supreme Spirit Krishna, Allah, Jehovah, Yahweh, these are all names of the divine. And when we make that connection, here in the bhakti tradition, we do that through mantra, through spiritual sound. And when we make that connection, then we come face to face. We feel the love. We are able to express our love. And in that moment of connection, uh, the past disappears, the future is irrelevant, and one is completely satisfied in the present. And this is what we seek. So much of our life we're lamenting about the past and, you know, uh, daydreaming about the future because the present hasn't become exciting enough for ourselves because in the present we're still disconnected. So the great saints are living in a timeless space because they've made that connection. Mm -hmm. And in that connection, um, perfection is there because there's a full giving of the heart and receiving of love. And so this is our life. Everything we're doing is... Um, one of our teachers, he once said, all of the reading that you're doing, all of the seva that you're doing, all of these uh, fasting and austerities and rules and regulations, the early mornings, is just so that one day you can sit in one corner of the room and sing one name of God and experience a genuine teardrop fall from your eye. And if you get there, then you made it. Wow. And so that's what we're trying to get to. It's very, very simple. Uh, a teardrop of love, um, of connection mm. with the divine. That's all we're looking for. Wow. <laughs> I'm almost, almost going to cry now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I almost went into like a trance state of meditation as you were speaking. And I want to encourage our listeners that, um, yeah, please kindly rewind the clock. I don't know, maybe it was a minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes ago, and just re-listen to that because I think um, that meditation, if you can just sit with that for a few minutes, it will really uh, start to move your life in a way which maybe you've never experienced before. Big claim, big claim, but it's an invite. It's an invite for you all the same. So, yeah, thank you so much, Maharaj. We're going to do thank some you. quick fire questions. It feels almost unnatural to do a quick fire. <laughs> this, is too deep. this is a too deep a conversation for a quick fire, you know, superficial combo. But I know some people love it, so we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> as as in the mood of service. Let's do it like that. Sure. Okay, quick fire. One word, one word, one sentence answers. Uh, what's something you're curious about right now? 
what my future will be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Often talking about being in the I'm present. I'm curious about your future. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, number two, what's something you're personally working through at the moment? Projecting on others. Oh, wow. Care to share? Uh, you said one one word answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I yeah, curious. I realized in my life I um, I really had a lot of unrealistic expectations of people, and I projected the way I live, the values I hold, the way I function, uh -huh. and expected everyone to live like me. Wow. And when they didn't, I thought there was something wrong with them. So nowadays, I say. Um, don't treat people as you'd like to be treated. Treat people as they'd like to be treated. Mm. Amen. In short, what legacy would you like to leave behind in the world? What do you want to be known for? Sharing wisdom that breathes. May it be. Something you used to deeply value but don't value as much anymore football <laughs> <laughs> oh no that could have been a connection point and finally last question if you could create one law that everyone in the world had to live by what would it be a room without books and a life without learning is a body without a soul so everyone's room should have some books in it and everyone's life should be full of learning and in that way it's a, a body with a vibrant soul. Wow. Wow. Psh. Can we just keep Keisha Maharaj here? <laughs> like, I don't know why we need any more guests. <laughs> Let's just call it the Keisha Maharaj show and uh, call off for, to for soul's sake. I'm, I'm done with the podcast otherwise. <laughs> Maharaj, it's been an absolute pleasure and a joy. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much Radical. for your, your time, your um, ability to disseminate wisdom so beautifully. And... Uh, yeah, thank you for being a mentor for me. Thank you for being someone who I can look up to that um, knows the way, shows the way, goes the way. And uh, yeah, it gives me a lot of faith and a lot of hope that maybe one day I can be a little bit more like you. So uh, with that, thank you so, so much from my heart. Thank you all for listening so, so attentively and so patiently. I hope there was something there for you. If there wasn't, I'm sorry, you're listening to the wrong podcast. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing here. But um, I genuinely hope that there was something there. And I want to invite you, please kindly fi find the permission, feel permissed to re-listen to this podcast. It's not something that you have to just throw away now you've listened to it. Maybe there was a point that you missed, a nuanced point, a subtle point, something that may transform your life. And I want to invite you rigorously, please re-listen to it if you feel that it was inspirational for you. And um, yeah, I can't wait to see you on the next episode of Soul Sake. Namaste. Souls.